neonatal care. And since the black and Hispanic communities are younger, they will want Medicare, medical care investment shifting to what they perceive as the greater need, and that is to the first five years of life. Because that, their argument is the last five years of life, a lot of the money spent is wasted money because the people are going to die anyway soon, and they're going to die no matter, in so many conditions no matter what care you give them. And there is a new concept that has come into medical care in the, in the last couple of years, besides the managed care, which is a whole other story, and that is the concept called feudal care, that certain kinds of treatments are feudal. Namely, they're not going to cure anybody. They're not going to necessarily prolong the life. They may raise the quality of the life in the time left, but it's feudal treatment. So why spend all this money on this so-called feudal treatment in the last years of life? So this is going to become, in the future, uh, as time goes on, a greater and greater, not only social policy issue, but also a greater political issue. <coughs> Hedging the older ethnic groups like Jews against the younger ethnic groups like Hispanics, who, for example, in this city are now the largest and fastest growing ethnic group. To make matters more complicated, I have been able to find no statistical proof anywhere that despite the huge investment Americans are making in medical care, almost 20% of our gross national product, there seems to be no statistical proof that Americans today are any healthier than before. And as a matter of fact, compared to the longevity of people in other first world countries, say the G7 countries, we're not at the top of the list. Say compared to Russia, we're doing very well. <laughs> but that's when you consider that the average lifespan of men, say in St. Petersburg, does not usually reach 50. It's now around 47 or something like this. So while we're doing better in terms of Russia, compare us to Sweden or Japan or uh, England or Canada, we're not doing very well. Furthermore, to make matters even more complicated, <clears throat> we are witnessing now many changes in the whole area of medicine and health care. First of all, we have the recent introduction of managed care, which many debate whether it's managed and whether it's care. Secondly, we have a move stimulated originally by the first Hilton, uh, Clinton uh, health plan toward less specialization and to more family practice and stuff like this. Now one of the problems with that is that the great glory of the American health care system, which has made it a system where people from other countries are interested in coming here for health care, is precisely the fact that we have such uh, advanced specialties. So if the thing that has made our health care system the envy of other countries, the fact that we have great specialties, and now you have a move against specialization, you're going to have a problem. In many hospitals now, there is increased use of foreign doctors simply to save money, particularly in attending physicians, hospital physicians, and residents. Question is, can they overcome cultural gaps between themselves and their patients? And are they providing a viable kind of medical care? We have increasing use of drugs for almost everything. And at the same time, we claim that we're fighting a drug culture. A good argument could be made that it's the medical industry that are the real 
drug kingpins in America. In other words, that they're the ones who are telling people if you have a problem or having people expect psychologically that if something bothers you, there's a pill to get rid of it. So you want to make a very fine distinction between the pharmaceutical culture and the drug culture, but can you really make that same distinction when the basic assumption is the same? We also have rather stunning developments continuously happening in medical science. And therefore you have, in a way, a kind of race between the development of medical technology and our ability and knowledge to know what to do with it and how to apply it and how to do it in a, in a way that won't bankrupt us. We also are witnessing shifts in the way physicians are being trained and we are witnessing shifts in the way we are looking at medical education. We have a shift going on in the role of the physician. Whereas in past years we had the idea of the kind of autocratic physician who told you what to do. You patient wasn't a participant in their own health care. Now we have the idea of the physician as a kind of partner in health care. And many physicians uh, in hospitals are no longer called physicians. They're called health care providers. Just the same way that the people who clean the bedpans are called health care providers in the hospitals to make a kind of democratization uh, of health care. Physicians are experiencing a loss of independence as insurance companies are telling them more and more what they can do and what they can't do. The doctor-patient relationship, according to many, is being disrupted by the growth of HMOs and PPOs where you have difficulty developing a relationship with the same physician. And perhaps on the good side of the change in the medical profession, you have now a profession that is much less dominated by males than it used to be. Now, a study was done in the United States and England in which they asked patients coming out of physicians' offices, was the reason that you first went to the physician's office satisfied? And they found consistently, both in the United States and in England, where you have two very different systems of medical care, that 80% of the people asked said no. In, other, in both countries. In other words, that the reason people went for the first place, and the reason people went to the doctor in the, for the first place was not satisfied, they were not satisfied that that issue, whatever it was, was addressed in the course of their visit. We also have changing concepts of health and disease. And I'll have more to say about this later, but just now, uh, two examples. One example comes from uh, a high school, I won't mention which one, in the northern suburbs here, where they changed the name of the gym department or the physical education department. And this is the new name now. Department of Kinetic Wellness. <laughs> That's the gym department. Department of Kinetic Wellness. In other words, here you have the idea that everything has to be reduced to health and wellness, including playing basketball. And the second example, which is related to the first, is the shift in using categories which are moral categories, like good and bad, to using health categories like healthy and not healthy. So then the goal becomes to be healthy rather than to be good. And that has enormous implications. In other words, you don't do something because it's the right thing to do. You do it because it's good for your health. 
To make matters even more, could you close the door? I have a question about that. Please. Um, wouldn't it be in a situation where you're using good or bad, um, isn't that a judgmental term as opposed to using, if someone is about is standing on a ledge, you're, it's not necessarily good or bad what they're doing, it's not healthy because they could, uh, wind could blow and they could die. It's not, I mean, so it's not all things fall into good or bad. No, not all, I'm not arguing that all things fill, fall into good or bad. What I'm arguing is that moral judgments are being replaced by health judgments. Now, if you want to argue you shouldn't make judgments, which is a very popular view these days, I would argue you cannot have a morality unless you make judgments, as Kant already said in the 18th century. Moral choice means making a moral judgment that certain things are good and certain things are bad. Okay. I mean, what's the alternative? The alternative is saying, I don't like this or I do like this, which is an old argument that morality is simply a matter of, of, of taste and personal preference. But for reasons that I tried to explain before, I don't see how that argument can be defended. You know, the Latin phrase for it is uh, de, gustub de gustubus non est disputandum. In matters of taste, we don't make, uh, you know, judgments. But nobody's going to stand in front of, uh, say, Auschwitz concentration camp and say, the holoc you know, genocide is a matter of taste. Morality means making certain judgments are good and certain bad. Um, moral judgment to use right and wrong as opposed to good and bad, because... Right and wrong is fine, I'm just saying that... Well, it's just because good or bad seems that, you know, it's a child behaves, you know, good or a child is bad, but, you know, it's like, but even that is judging, and it's, but it's not judging in a, in a positive or um, purposeful manner, whereas right or wrong or healthy or unhealthy is a matter of, whereas healthy and unhealthy is not a moral judgment, um, are ways that can be corrected or changed. Because if someone is bad, they're bad. Their action is bad and they can't change it. And if they're morally destined, in essence, if someone says, well, what you're doing is bad, if they're morally destined to be bad and not to change. Look, the thing that I'm arguing is that what is happening, it seems to me, more and more is that people are replacing right and wrong with, uh, let me use those, your terms, which are okay, with healthy and unhealthy. And healthy and unhealthy have no moral connotations. And where it leads to is it frees people from having to take any responsibility for what they do. With respect to health, or with respect to... If you reduce morality to health, yeah. then the people are off the hook. They're doing the things they're doing because they're not healthy. Let me give you an example, which was a big article in New Yorker magazine about a year and a half ago. There was a big article about Hitler. And there are many uh, psycho-historians now who are arguing Hitler didn't do anything morally wrong because he was an abused child. And because he was an abused child, he couldn't help being a genocidal maniac that turned the war, world upside down and ended up with 20 million people killed in the war because he was unhealthy. So because he was unhealthy, 20 million people died. But we shouldn't blame him for that. He shouldn't have any moral responsibility for that. That, in my view, is the problem when you transpose um, moral categories into therapeutic categories. Isn't that what happens in the law somewhat too, though, when they're... Um, in the law? Yes, because they say somebody is unhealthy, there's psychosis, and they can't change it. Yeah. And that's what they do. Yeah. Well, that's what they do. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Secondly, when you're dealing with American law and British law, you have another problem that I don't want to get into too deeply here, and that is that there is a very old tradition in Anglo-American law, it's, all, it's rooted in, in, in Christian thought, that makes a sharp distinction between law and morality. In other words, there is a very deep tradition in Anglo-American law that law has nothing to do with morality. In other words, that morality is a private issue and law deals with the person as a social being. And the law's only business is to try to regulate social relations so people don't step on each other's toes and don't hurt each other and everybody's rights are satisfied. But that morality is a private business. This is why I say in American law you have the First Amendment, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, all these private, these are private things. There shouldn't be laws about them. Government shouldn't intrude there. These are private things. It's when the private things interact with the public things, then you have to make some laws. In Jewish laws, I tried to explain the moral and the legal are interwoven. The law, in my view, tries to offer a way of concretely, in a very concrete way, expressing moral claims. And here is, I think, a way in which Judaism differs also from Christianity because Christianity sort of leaves these amorphous moral claims without explaining what they are. So you have, for example, a statement which we'll discuss, not tonight, but later on, you should love your neighbor as yourself. So it's very nice, you should love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, Christianity mostly left it vague. Jewish sources immediately began to ask the question, what means, who is the neighbor, what means love, what means and, what means yourself, <laughs> what's the relationship between you and your neighbor and yourself and as, and is it more and less, and can a person do it and everything else. Because you have to have a very concrete idea of what this means. You translate the moral idea into a concrete idea. But, uh, in Anglo-American tradition, you have this distinction. So uh, the starting point is that the law and morality should not necessarily have anything to do with one another. I remember uh, when my wife was in law school, she came home one day, she was all upset. She said, uh, I've been reading these cases and, uh, and the law isn't just. I said, why do you assume it should be? It has to be constitutional. It doesn't have to be just. It doesn't have to be moral. It just has to be constitutional. That's all. Yep. Let me ask you if this fits your health versus morality. I just read a Newsweek article about adultery that 25% of people believe you should not commit adultery because you might get a sexually transmitted disease. <laughs> That's the reason. Is that a good example of what? Like no, that's not what I meant. <laughs> okay. No, that's not what I meant. Okay. <laughs> no, I meant that your motivation for doing something should be because it's right or wrong, right. not because it's healthy or unhealthy. Well, that's what this is. They're motivated out of health concern, not out of moral concern. Well, this is why you shouldn't do something right. out of health. Yes. Right. Yes. So, so does that apply to what you're talking about? More or less, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But in, in this context, healthy usually refers to psychologically healthy. Oh, okay. But wouldn't healthy coincide with morally right? Uh, Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. On your first question, you said that the success of a first business has really not been successful. The visit to the doctor. That's what the studies have shown, right. right. Don't you think, though, that um, displaces responsibility of the, of the client or the patient? I mean, why is this... Um, I don't understand. Well, if you're spending 20% uh, of your gross national product on a service industry, and 80% of the customers are not happy, if it were any other industry, it would be bankrupt in 10 seconds. What other industry can get away with that? 
Don't you think the responsibility falls on the I'm going to discuss that later when I discuss the physician uh, patient relationship and the role of the of the patient, but I'm I'm still very far away. What, yeah. What's the date on I don't know, but it's the late 1980s, early 1990s. Now, to make matters even more complicated, we have in recent years the introduction of both European and Asian and homeopathic and other theories of health care into our health care system. Generally called alternative medicines, I, I don't like that term because as soon as you say they're an alternative, the assumption is they're alternative to something else and the something else is, may be better than the alternatives. Maybe our health care system is really the alternative. Maybe the others are the real ones or maybe all of them together will become a composite of the one we need. So I don't, I don't like this term alternative because it, it, it's already a packed term. So I'd rather use these other terms uh, uh, to denote them. Now, the final point I want to make of the problem statement has to do with something that is related to medicine but only indirectly and that is what sociologists are now finding of a growing distrust of people in science as a way of solving their problems and as a way of presenting truth and as a way of presenting fact. So that the reason you could have a kind of authoritative, you know, physician, you know, Dr. Welby knows everything type guy, is because the assumption was that what they knew and what they taught was true. Now, with, when you have conflicting reports of the truth from scientists, and one day you have a trend claiming this is the way to go, and the next minute you have another study claiming this is not the way to go, the reaction of the general populace is confusion mm -hmm. and a, lo a lack of trust. And if you think of, uh, I mean, just you can think of in your own knowledge and experience of, of different uh, views. Or, or one, you know, one minute everybody in America is eating oats, everything, <laughs> right? Because the assumption is that it's going to lower your cholesterol. So all of a sudden you have, you know, not only oat cereal, but oat bagels and oat cakes and oat, oat oatmeal and oat, <laughs> oat uh, God knows what. Everything was oats. Then all of a sudden they found out uh, there was some problems with that study. So all of a sudden people aren't eating oats. So every couple of months you have another, you know, trend. And people are confused. And they have now found out that most people aren't taking any of these studies seriously. That despite all of the studies about red meat, red meat consumption is up. Smoking is up. Chocolate is up. <laughs> Sugar consumption is up. And some are reading these signs as the result of people saying, well, you can't seem, to, you scientists can't seem to make up your mind what's good for us. And people are saying, but, you know, I saw my friend so-and-so, he did all the right things, and he's dead. And this guy did all the wrong things, my other friend, and he's, you know, jogging right, puffing right along. So how can you account for that? And they can't. So it seems that you have a growing distrust of the sciences and therefore growing distrust of the advice of physicians. Don't you think this is excuse me, part of the growing distrust trend of everything? Politicians, teachers, perhaps even rabbis. Rabbis is a long story. 
You know this. You know the, the riddle. How a rabbi is like mezuzahs. Oh, no. You know what a mezuzah is? The thing you put on the door. The answer is everybody likes them hanging around, but nobody pays any attention to them. <laughs> <laughs> so with rabbis, it's an old thing, you know. Yeah, but I'm talking about the general trend, the, the, the negativism of society, today, even among our young people. But the, que the question I'm asking is, why is that? It's a good question. And my answer is because nobody seems to have an idea of what's true. My second part of the answer is that, in, at least here, in this country, it seems to me, the image of truth overshadows the reality of truth. In other words, we're an image-producing society rather than trying to find some kind of truth behind the images. And from a theological point of view, it seems to me that the prohibition against idolatry, the strongest prohibition in the Bible, is a prohibition against not simply making the idols, but it's a prohibition against confusing the image with reality. That's how I would translate idolatry today. The confusion of the image with the real thing. And you have a society, it seems to me, that is trying to convince you to buy the image. I mean, what's advertising? It's image. You go to buy a pair of gym shoes today. Mm. So you have uh, this guy's gym shoe and that guy's gym shoe and Jordan and Rodman and uh, Barkley and this one and that one. I mean, is it that much difference? The difference is the ones that don't have their names on are $30 and these are $90. So. Yeah. Um, Sprite even took advantage of the whole image thing. I mean, the commercial says image is nothing, first is everything. Mm -hmm. So they took it in the reverse, using the same idea right. of image. Right. You see, I think the, the, the interest now in mysticism is connected to all this. Mm -hmm. Because the claim of the mystics is that it's possible to find a way to perceive the reality beyond the image, beyond the illusion. Unfortunately, most people I've found, and I've taught mysticism for over 25 years, is that most people want instant mysticism. Like in, everything in America is instant, instant coffee, instant mysticism. And they don't want to undertake the discipline that the mystics of the past undertook to get that vision of the truth beyond the reality. But that's another issue. Truth beyond the reality? Truth beyond the reality. Truth, truth beyond the, uh, the, illusion. the illusion, right. And to tell you the truth, since you asked, the quote that keeps popping into my mind when you mention these kinds of things is the quote from the British Catholic scholar Chesterton. He, had a, he was very good with quotes. He had a lot of good aphorisms. And one of his ones that I find most scary is when he says, a person who can believe in, noth in, in nothing can believe in anything. In other words, the person who doesn't know what their convictions are, who is open to everything, is dangerous because they can believe in, the, in the, any nonsense. And so if you have a throwing off of authority, on the one hand, you can reach a point where people say, well, I don't want to live in a moral anarchy, so I'll go to the other extreme where someone will tell me what to do and I'll just follow this. And this, it seems to me that the, the cults and the pull to the right in, the in all of the religious communities, including the Jewish community, is as dangerous as the, maybe more dangerous as the pull the other way. There's less, there's less dialogue on the right. Maybe. There's no possibility for dialogue because a per these are people who believe in nothing, all of a sudden have something to believe in, and they can't see outside of this. 
and you get to a fanaticism. I spent three weeks in Jerusalem this uh, summer. I saw it very clearly there. Among Jews? Among Jews, particularly among Jews, where they made a, a, a municipal rule now in Jerusalem that women can't go to Supersol. Supersol is this major supermarket there, you know, like Jewel or Dominic or something, if they're not wearing long sleeves. Is that only in the old city? No, in Jerusalem. And there's a tremendous, there's a tremendous flight now of uh, Israelis from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv because they can't put up with this uh, fanaticism anymore. It's getting very bad. So you, pardon me. Shades of Afghanistan. Well, I don't know about Afghanistan, but uh, I know what's going on there. So you can keep in mind Chesterton's uh, phrase. Sometime, a person who can believe in nothing can believe in anything. Now, I would suggest to you that the issue of how health care is delivered is an issue we're all concerned with. It's an issue much debated in this country and other countries. But that what most people forget is that underlying any system of health care is a philosophy, or if you want, a theology, which deals with such ideas as the nature of the human being, the nature of health, the nature of disease, the nature of medical practice, and the nature of the relationship between the physician and the patient. So therefore, what I'm suggesting is that the real issue is not which healthcare delivery system we adapt. The real question is that before we decide which system we would favor one over the other, we have to first clarify the underpinning philosophical and theological assumptions of the system that we would favor one over the other. Because what I'm suggesting is that every system every approach to these problems rests upon certain theological and philosophical issues. And so the question I want to focus on is what are the basic philosophical, theological assumptions of the way healthcare is now delivered? And what are the basic philosophical, theological assumptions of say, the vision that comes out of Jewish sources regarding the delivery of health care. So first, I want to look at the, what seem to me to be the three dominant models of health care or philosophy of health care in practice today, and then to take a look at the Jewish approach or a Jewish approach to these issues. The first model or the first understanding of the nature of health and health care that I want to uh, introduce is the official definition of health put forth by the World Health Association of the United Nations. In other words, this definition of health is the official definition subscribed to by the world as represented in the United Nations and as represented in WHO or the World Health Organization. And I'm just going to read you the first paragraph of this definition of the World Health Organization definition of health. Here it is. Health is a state of complete physical mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of a disease or infirmity. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease, of a disease or infirmity. Now, you see any problems with this? 
What problem do you see in this? Too big. Too broad in the sense of what? It just helps well, me. That's almost perfection. Thing. That's exactly it. In other words, can anybody attain this? Do you know anybody like this? Who has complete, who is in a, do you know anybody who's in a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of in disease or infirmity? In other words, do you know anyone who's healthy? <laughs> According to this definition. Complete. Close to complete. No, complete. <laughs> All the time. Complete. <laughs> so is it attainable? <laughs> That's it. That's going to be my second model. Oh, I'm sorry. And don't be sorry. <laughs> don't be sorry. Well, this definition, Professor, this definition was really never taken too seriously. Nothing the UN does is taken too seriously, but it's still one that is subscribed to by countries of the world. I mean, it's an official definition that people worked on, so it expresses a certain cultural uh, bias. And I'm suggesting it's a cultural bias that influences the way things are done. In other words, if you said, how can a country spend over a trillion dollars a year in health care? Well, if everybody's sick, why not? What about the mental part? Uh, what about it? There are different degrees of neurosis that everybody has. <laughs> well, I, that's true. But the question I would have is not simply where is the mental part, because they do men mention mental, but where is the spiritual part? Now, here I want to throw out a question, see if what you think of this. According to this definition, health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease. Here's the question. Can a person be healthy and still have a disease? Yes. yes. Not according to this definition. How can it be healthy? Is that mm -hmm. sure, yeah, so. What disease can you have and still well, be healthy? It all a cold or? It depends on your definition of disease. If you have this defi of, of health, if you have this definition of health, it's not possible. A good example is a person who is a controlled diabetic. Mm -hmm. Yes. You're not healthy if you're diabetic. Controlled diabetic. It, it really depends on, it, it, it's exactly how, how you then start defining it. I mean, you work with people who are HIV positive and they're considered healthy and stuff and there's a, it's all dependent on how you're defining what how you're defining that status. That's what I'm going to get to a little later so let's hold it but I'm I'm advocating this position that it's possible for a person to be healthy and still have a disease while it is also possible for a person not to have a disease and not to be healthy. You'll have to go into detail with that. I'll go into detail with that. I'll go into detail with that. Now let's move to the second uh, popular approach. And I already discussed this with you once before, so I don't want to get into it in any detail. But it correlates with the first, and that is what is generally called the therapeutic approach which is based on the discussion of the nature of disease. What is the idea of disease? How does a person get a disease? What is a disease? Say you wake up one morning, you don't feel well. 
So how did you, how did it come you didn't feel well? What happened? That's where you start looking at all the different models because um, Chinese is going to say something. No, I'm not going to talk here about models. The average person gets up. They have, say, a flu or something like this. How did you get this flu? You don't know. A virus. A virus. <coughs> All right? Now, take these two words, flu, virus. What does flu mean? Influenza. Influenza. What does influenza mean? Influence. Influence of what? You ever think about it? Take the word virus. Virus means what? Live. Pardon me? Live. Live. Live what? So one of the dominant theories in disease today has, or not today, for the last 200 years has been that what makes you sick, see in English we even use the expression, what makes you sick? In other words, you don't make you sick, something else makes you sick. The influence. Something outside of you gets inside of you and makes you sick. Disease comes from outside. Sometimes. And goes in. No, I'm talking about this idea. It comes from outside and goes in and makes you sick. You are a victim of external forces. The influence, for example. Now, you might call these external forces, say, what? A virus. A bug. Pardon me? A bug. A bug. Bacteria. A germ. How about genetic sources? Chronic. Genetics is, is, is now becoming big, we're, so we're making a shift. Isn't that, can't that be construed as external to coming from? It's something, yeah, I got it. So it's external, fine. But you had nothing to do with it. Not your business. What thing bothers you? Now, if you look at it in the following way, think about it this way. If I told you that the reason you get sick is because of demons. You know, you'd tell me to go check into the Elgin home for the bewildered, right? <laughs> but if you think about it, what's the difference between saying it's a demon, a virus, a germ, or a buck? It's just a different word. It's not a demon is not uh, a, a material substance. A virus is? A germ. A virus is? Well, it's a physical pro has a physical pro Well, so you can say so does demons. No, demons also have, phys have physical properties. Sure they do. Read Singer. <laughs> sure they have physical presence. Look, let me give you an example. Rashi. You heard of Rashi? Right? Rashi says, after you eat, in his commentary to the Talmud, he says, after you eat, you should wash your hands. Why? Because demons get on your fingers, and if you put your hands in your mouth before you eat, the demons will go from your fingers in your mouth, and they'll make you sick. Now, what's the difference of that and saying, wash your hands before you eat, because there are germs, on the hands, or bacteria on the hands, or something else on the hands, and if you put them in your mouth, you'll get sick. What's the difference? There's a big difference, because there actually are germs and viruses. Well, why can't we say that there are the demons is another name for germ and virus? Well, demons don't go away when you wash your hands. No, Rashi says they do. That's why you wash your hands. <laughs> demons imply an intelligence or a conspiracy. I think that's... that's viruses are, sm I would say, they're even smarter than demons, because oh, they yeah. can mutate faster. Demons have trouble mutating, and demons are a little <laughs> slow, you know. But I'm just saying, if, why can't we believe it's demons if you can believe it's germs? Because it's not true. How do you know it's not true? <laughs> I know, it definitely could work that demons or germs could be interchangeable. I know many children who are told stories of 
germs that if you don't if you don't do this and you don't do that, the germs are going to get you. And it's just the same way as telling the story about the demons are going to get you. Right. So my point is that this theory that's supposed to be a scientific theory that external things enter internally and make you sick is not a simply a scientific theory. It's an old theory, pre-scientific theory that there are external things that enter in that make you sick, that you're a victim of external things. And you need to take certain preventative measures against them. So one may be a flu shot, another may be an amulet. Maybe the amulet works better than the flu shot. So you don't wash your hands before you eat? I, maybe I do it to get rid of the demons, not to get rid of the bacteria. <laughs> Now, what I'm suggesting here is that when you have the idea that illness is only generated from without and that the person becomes sick as a victim of external forces, then you are led to the view that the person has no responsibility for the illness that the person is simply a victim of external forces and that the person should therefore also have no role in their cure and we should leave it all to the so-called helping professions. In other words, if everybody is a victim of external forces, then everybody is sick. And if everybody is sick, everybody needs help. And if everybody is sick and everybody needs help, that makes the healing professions or the helping professions a very big growth industry. Now, I think I asked this to you once before. What book has been on the bestseller list now longer than any other book on the bestseller list? The Road Less Traveled. Right. What? The Road Less Traveled. Oh, M. Scott Peck. Wow. <laughs> 10 years or 11 years on the bestseller list. Here's one sentence from that book. This is Dr. M. Scott Peck, who is a psychiatrist. Most of us are mentally ill to a greater or lesser degree. Now, if most of us are mentally ill, as a Christian, then psychiatry is a big growth business, right? Last week we discussed the meaning of life, right? That's a good class. Thank you. <laughs> now, I discussed with you once this book which has all of the uh, syndromes that people have, right? Yes, Diagnostic and Statistical <coughs> Manual of Mental Disorders. Which edition? Four, Fourth, four. right. <laughs> One of the uh, one of the uh, identity dis one of the uh, disorders listed there is called identity disorder. Mm -hmm. What is the symptom of an identity disorder? A person is asking who he is. <laughs> In other words, it sort of strikes me as the person as the famous letter that Freud wrote to Marie Bonaparte. You know about that letter? No. Freud wrote to Marie Bonaparte. She wrote him a letter asking him the meaning of life. And he wrote back to her saying, if you are asking what is the meaning of life, it shows that you're already a neurotic. Mm -hmm. Neurotic, <laughs> mentally ill. There's a difference between being neurotic and mentally ill. Mentally ill is, re is removed from reality. Uh, neurotic is, is a, a sort of defense system that people put up to cope with problems. Okay. Not in Freud. We're talking about Freud here, here, Freud's letter. But the point is, not this, the point is that this lady is saying to him, what's the meaning of life? He says, the fact you ask this question means you're sick. You ask who you are, have a, you have identity disorder, you're sick. Uh, you come late for work, you're sick. Uh, this guy with the Twinkie defense, he's sick. So the idea is everybody's sick. 
that's a therapeutic view. Therapeutic view of medicine, of medical care. Everybody's sick. If you're not physically sick, then everybody is mentally sick. <coughs> Sneeze means it's true. Now you have the third model. The third model is the one you mentioned before, and that is what is generally called the biomedical model. There was a very uh, often quoted article by Professor George Engel of the University of Rochester Medical School in Science Magazine in April of 1977 called The Need for a New Medical Model, A Challenge for Biomedicine, in which he presented the biomedical model and then showed its deficiencies. The biomedical model, which according to Engel and many others, is the one that dominates contemporary American medical practice, begins with the assumption that the human being is like a kind of machine, made up of a, vari of a variety of systems, and that there are certain norms imposed on how those systems function. If the system or part of the system, <coughs> say meaning an organ, breaks down, you have to figure out how to fix it. If the norms that are applied to measuring how well the systems are working aren't met, then you have to fix them to make sure the body works according to those norms. And commenting on the biomedical model, Engel argues that the belief in the biomedical model is a kind of folk belief, a kind of folklore, he says, which happens to dominate American medical practice. The problem, he says, with, the, with this model is, number one, that it is based on a view of the body as a machine, which essentially is a 17th century idea, leaves out the emotional, spiritual, even psychological, because it reduces the psychological to the physiological, dimensions of human experience. And as one of his tests, he says, suppose a person comes into his doctor, and the, doct and the person is obviously in bad shape, can function, and all his tests come back very bad, but the person is otherwise is really in perfect health. They can't find anything wrong with them. And the doctor says, I, I don't know what, I, you know, you don't have this, you don't have this, you don't have this, you don't have this, but you're obviously sick. What's wrong with you? And the patient says, I'm sad. I'm sad. Does the physician under the biomedical model have a way of dealing with this? Engel says, no. So therefore, he says, this model isn't sufficient. Well, that's not a way of dealing with it. That's a way of dealing with the symptoms, not with the core, not with the cause. You said last week there was an ego problem if someone's depressed, right? That's what the Baal Shem Tov said. Right. Professor Eric Cassell at, universe, at Cornell University has described the relationship of the physician's examination to the patient's condition under the biomedical model as what he calls a matching game. And that's why he says diagnosis is usually not successful. The matching game is the patient comes in and the patient is manifesting these symptoms. You make a list of all the symptoms. And then you have in your 
either in your head or your computer bank, a list of all the diseases that we know about. And then what you try to do is you match up the symptoms to the disease. You know, like that quiz show on television, the matching game. And if you have a match, that's it. But you might have a match and not really know what's wrong with the patient. Say so the patient may be manifesting, say, symptoms of, let's use the example we gave before, diabetes. And the patient may actually have diabetes. So you can give the patient say in a controlled diabetic, uh, diabetes 2 situation, uh, uh, say a, a pill. But would that address the underlying reason that triggered the diabetes to begin with? No. Say the person is going through some life crisis situation. Say the person is, is undergoing some extreme stress situation. Diagnosing the person as a diabetic and giving them the pill isn't going to solve, address that situation, which may be then triggering other diseases to manifest themselves, which the person may be genetically predisposed to. And dealing with the diabetic situation would be dealing only with a very small part of what's going on with the person as a whole. So this is the point that uh, Professor uh, Cassell makes. Furthermore, Cassell argues that the problem, therefore, of much diagnosis is that it doesn't solve the real problem. And that ties in with the study I mentioned to you before of why people aren't satisfied going to the physician. Because it can make the match of the symptom and the disease, but not address what's really bothering the person that brought about the manifestation of those symptoms. Psychosomatic? No, it's not psychosomatic. If a person, say, is undergoing a trauma, yeah. they have a genetic predisposition, say, to diabetes. Oh, okay. It triggers the diabetes. It triggers if they have a pre genetic predisposition, say, to heart disease. Triggers the heart disease. Uh, that's not psychosomatic. The disease is real. Right. But, but the issue really is the physician not being able to, for whatever reason, no, I'm spend time with the patient to talk about the underlying causes. Well, here, here's a second article I want to bring to your attention, an article uh, which was written by a group of psychiatrists um, at a, at a uh, hospital in Boston, at Beth Israel Hospital in Boston, called In Search of the Biopsychosocial Perspective, an Experiment with medical students. In other words, they ask this question. Why don't physicians look into the, you know, why do they take this matching game approach? And their findings were that medical school, like any professional school, aims not only at teaching the person the subject, but also at socializing the person into the profession. You know, when you go, say, you go to law school, you say, I remember that show with John Hausman, you're not here simply to learn the law, you're here to think like a lawyer, you know. So it's, you learn to think like the profession. So there's an underlying philosophy, there's an underlying view of things. And what the study of these medical students showed is that it, already in the first year of law school, they are socialized to the biomedical model. In other words, they're socialized to this, what Engel calls folklore, to believe that that's the truth and that that's the way medicine should be practiced and that it's not necessary even to look beyond that because that's what medical science is. In other words, it's not simply a question of time. It's a question of socialization into medical practice and a philosophy of medicine that the medical student becomes socialized into and that then shapes how he or she looks at the practice of medicine. 
So to expect them to get to etiological issues, in other words, to the underlying causes, to go beyond the matching game, as Cassell suggests, is pointless because they're already socialized against it. And therefore, what Cassell argues and what uh, Engel argues and what others are now arguing is that what we have to do is exactly what we're discussing here, and that is to reconceptualize the whole idea of medical care, the whole idea of disease, the whole idea of health, the whole idea of the physician-patient relationship, because the way we have it isn't working, and certainly not working in a very cost-effective way. And the first thing you have to do in order to do that is to realize that the medical care we're delivering now is based on certain models that simply, for one reason or another, are wrong and don't work, and that we should therefore not socialize physicians in the medical schools into these philosophies and should seek other philosophies. The question then obviously is, what other philosophies? What I'm going to suggest a little later is that Jewish thought at least presents, as I started with, the second opinion. You might not like it, you might not want to take it, but at least it's a second opinion. Just like in the medical schools, the doctors, when they finish, they take the Hippocratic Oath. Now, in a number of places, they have rejected the Hippocratic Oath. Wow. And because the Hippocratic Oath, for example, would eliminate practice of abortions. It says specifically in the Hippocratic Oath, no abortions. And in, in many medical schools, for example, especially in Florida, they are using the so-called Maimonides Prayer of the Physician. Unfortunately, Maimonides didn't write it, but that's a whole other story. I'll discuss that with you another time. But, but we won't tell, right? Won't tell who? Maimonides? No. <laughs> anybody, anybody who thinks that Maimonides didn't write it. No, you can tell whoever you want. <laughs> Just don't tell the, if you go in the doctor's office, I very often, you know, visit doctors who have on their wall in the office, Jewish doctors, especially the Maimonides Prayer of the Physician that they shelled out a few hundred dollars for. I don't tell them. <laughs> but Maimonides Prayer of the Physician uh, was not written by Maimonides, for sure. What about the preventive medicine? I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. All I'm trying to do now is to establish that there are Dominant views of medicine, you, you all seem to recognize these, I'm not telling you anything uh, esoteric, that dominate the views of health, disease, medical care, and so forth, and that they're problematic, and that we need to look at an alternative, and that one of those alternatives could be uh, coming out of Jewish tradition. That's so far all I as far as I am. Please, well, I interrupt. Let me reject another thought. You haven't mentioned the word ethics in an hour and 15 minutes. Is there a reason why it happens? What word? Ethics. I haven't mentioned it because I'm speaking about models in which it doesn't seem to play a major role. Well, you said morality over health choices. Health that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Look, if you have the who definition, morality doesn't come in. If you have the therapeutic definition, the whole idea is that the person is not responsible for anything they do because they're a victim of some outside force. That they have some kind of syndrome and they can't control themselves and this and that. And the biomedical model is a totally mechanistic model. And uh, what does ethics have to do with it? That's why I haven't mentioned. Please. Um, I was just going to mention just on the, um, on the tail end of that um, article at Beth Israel Hospital in Boston that there are medical schools now that are training um, med students to socialize them within their first quarter. They're giving them interviewing classes. So they learn how to interview and speak with patients and talk with patients before they even get their hands on a cadaver or anatomy to find problems. So in, in some schools it is switching, but out of that study, as a result of that study, but for the most part, it still is the biomedical model. 
Right, right, for sure. But this is very new. Mm -hmm. This isn't, you know, 50 years going on. We don't have so many doctors out that have gone through that, but they're still in school. <laughs> uh huh. So the question still is: Does is it a way that is it a pedagogic techniques that that works? In other words, it's nice they learn how to interview patients in the first year, but in the first year, are they like the fourth son in the Passover Seder who don't even yet know the questions to ask? There was a hand here, so. I, I was just going to comment on that from having been in the field for a long time is that even people who are, in theory, being socialized and being introduced to a lot of these things, ultimately they're still being turned right into a biomedical model. Um, I, I, so, hopefully down the road, but. <laughs> All right, now let me just introduce the idea of health as it emerges in Jewish sources, and then we'll take a little break, and then I'll go into detail into all of the uh, issues that you very patiently waited to hear, including preventative medicine. There are two terms which are used in Hebrew for health. One you find in medieval Hebrew, And one you find even in contemporary Hebrew. Shlemut and Briut. Now what I'm going to suggest is that in looking at the etymological roots of these words, will come closer to an idea of what health is conceived to be in Jewish sources. Shlemut comes from the root shalem, meaning complete. It's the same root as the Hebrew word shalom. So in a sense, if you say to the person, are you whole, are you complete, do you have shalom? You're asking, are you healthy? And in English, the word health comes from the old English word hal, which means the same thing, whole. Whole with a W. In other words, the idea is that when the person is whole, the person has health. So it's not simply a physical health. It's a physical and spiritual health. Physical, spiritual, emotional, so forth. It's say like the medievals would say, it's a health of the body, and a health of the soul. Now, the medievals would go further than the moderns and say that since health of the soul for the medievals is cultivation of the moral virtues, moral, health, moral you know, development, that the person who is healthy is the person who is not only physical healthy, physically okay, but morally developed. So it's, to put it in a more contemporary idiom, it's a holistic view of health. It's not a mechanistic view of health. It's not a who view of health, a World Health Organization view of health. Because in this view, it's possible to have, be, have a disease and be healthy. In other words, you don't have to be perfect in order to be healthy. <clears throat> you could have, say, even a non-controlled uh, diabetes and be healthy. Because you look at the whole person, not simply at how one organ happens to be functioning at one particular time. So the person who, say, is a diabetic because they have uh, some, say, pancreatic uh, 
problems can be healthy. And the second definition makes it, the second term makes it even more clear how that could be possible. The second term, say, in Hebrew, when a person sneezes, what do you say? Labriyut, to health. Briyut comes from the root bara, which happens to be the second word in the Bible. Create. In other words, in this view, health is identified with creativity. To put it in a framework I introduced to you before, in a previous meeting, health is creating life as a work of art. Creating one's life as a work of art. In other words, the person is healthy in this view who is creative, who is productive. And in this view, it is, simple, it is very simple to understand how a person can have a disease and yet have health. Because a person can be sick. A person can have a disease. A person can be an amputee. A person can be deaf, like, say, Beethoven and certainly be creative. So here the health of the person is not determined by whether their cholesterol is over, you know, 210 or not, or whether their pancreas is putting out this much insulin or that much insulin, or whether the person uh, has arthritis in the hand or doesn't. Health is determined by the person's ability to continue to create their life as a work of art, to be creative, to be productive, to contribute to society, to other people. So here you have a totally different view of health based on the etymology of these words than you have in the dominant views of medical care today. And let me introduce just one other word here, which we'll discuss after the break, and that is the physician. What word is physician close to? Physical. In other words, here the term physician itself is pointing in a certain direction to a physicalistic, mechanistic view of human nature, not to this polar view of human nature, not to body, soul, not to dust divinity, but to simply one side of the coin, the physical nature, correlative with the biomedical model. The physician is the one who takes care of the physical part. But in Hebrew, what is the word for physician? Rofe, which means the one who cures. The one who cures. And the word for example, that you have in museums to curate, like an exhibit, you curate, is related to the word to cure. In other words, he's sort of the curator of the body, of the person, rather. He's sort of the one who helps you develop life as the work of art. But etymologically, the word rofe does not mean the healer or the curer. The word rofe comes from the root rapa, which means to ease, to ease. And this you can see, understand very well. You have the English word disease. So the physician is one 
who, re who removes the thing that doesn't give you ease. The disease is the thing that takes away ease. The physician is the one then who eases, who takes away the impediment that's preventing you from going further in the creation of life and in the wholeness of life. So here I would suggest simply from the etymology of these three words, you have a basis for a Jewish view of health care. We'll take a little break now and then I'm going to discuss with you uh, the basis for the role of the physician, the role of the patient, and then the relationship uh, between the two. I want now to turn to the um, nature of health care or nature of medical care in Jewish sources. And we find, beginning in the Talmud, in the rabbinic period, an attempt to justify the employment of medical care. This already assumes two things. It assumes that in the Bible itself, the propriety of medical care is not assumed to be clear. In other words, if the rabbis have to try to prove why health care, why medical care, why practicing medicine is okay to do, if in the Bible it was clearly okay, they wouldn't have to try to prove it. So that's one problem. The second problem is that you could perhaps find a reason based on the Bible why it's not okay. In other words, there might be theological objections or scriptural objections to the practice of medical care and therefore you need to justify the opposite in some way. So before giving you some examples of how it was justified, I want first to describe why there was a need to justify it conceptually. And the fact that we find this need to justify it conceptually seems to indicate that there must have been opposition somewhere in the Jewish community that time, which held, who held that it wasn't justified by tradition to practice medicine. Now, let me give you one example, which is the major example, but has a number of parts. In the Bible, you have many examples of people who are described as becoming sick, ill, because God is punishing them for some sin. Mm -hmm. And you have many texts that deal with specific people. King so-and-so did this and this and then he became sick. So God was punishing him. Or you have non-specific examples of people. In other words, if you do this, then you're going to get punished and the punishment will be some kind of sickness. Usually they pick big ones to scare people, like the AIDS of the biblical period, which was leprosy. In other words, the argument runs like this. If you can interpret illness, sickness, as a punishment for a sin by God, then Medical care is the intervention of our attempt to intervene in God, what God did. It's our attempt to undo what God did. It's, in a way, a kind of uh, rejection 
of uh, God's prerogative or something like this. And connected to this is, in theological terms, the idea of providence. Namely, if God rewards the good and punishes the evil, and one of the ways God does this is to reward the good with good health and the evil people with bad health, then who are we to come and interfere? A second part of this is the interpretation by some religious groups, even today, of a verse in the Bible, which in Hebrew is Ki ani Hashem Rofecha, I, the Lord, am your healer. In other words, God is the healer. If God wants you to be healthy, you'll be healthy. And if you're sick and God wants you to be cured, he'll cure you. So human beings should not interfere. That's Christian science. Amongst other groups. I once uh, had a student who said that God gave her a power that comes from God and runs through her body and comes out her hands and she can cure people. Because I came into class that day, I had a headache and I was taking an aspirin. She said, don't take the aspirin. I'll put my hands there and uh, I'll cure you because God gave me the power and it goes, you know. So one of the other students yelled out, well, why don't you put your hands on your head and cure yourself? <laughs> Doesn't matter what class. Don't ask who the student was either. Did she cure your headache? No, she didn't cure my headache, but she told me she could do it also over the telephone. <laughs> Long distance even. <laughs> Is this on the level, or are you just making us laugh? <laughs> I'm not. I'm maybe I'm, I'm not making you laugh. You're making you laugh. This happened to me. What can I tell you? <laughs> I'm going to write a book one day about all of these things that happened to me. <laughs> it's called the What Happens When You Teach Mysticism. Oh, great. That's a great idea. I once had a guy write me who was on death row in Sing Sing prison who was there for multiple uh, murders. And he asked, told me that he didn't do the multiple murders, even though there were eyewitnesses, but he confessed to doing it because he was possessed. Mm. And asked if I would exercise him over the phone, and then he would get off. I tell you other things, but the camera is rolling and it might be, you know, <laughs> rated X, some of the things. <laughs> Every time we hire a new secretary here, I have to sit down with her or him and tell them, you know, if you get some kind of strange calls, you know, do you, do you do exorcisms on the phone? Do you make house calls for exorcisms? Do you... Uh, do faith healing, so he just don't be yeah, surprised. Uh, well, I didn't ask this guy whether he watched it after he murdered these three people or before he murdered these three people, but for sure he did. I don't understand why he called a rabbi. Was he Jewish? He was a Hasidic Jew from Brooklyn. No. Really? Yes. And he read about me in some book they had in the prison library on exorcism. <laughs> Maybe there's some kind of, you know, uh, yellow pages of the occult, you know, exorcist, or I'm not, maybe listed there, I don't know. I know I get a lot of calls from a lot of people, from a lot of places, for a lot of bizarre things. Pardon me? Well, I don't know why people would think that of you. Because you write about it or because maybe you do it? <laughs> Whether I do it or not is another story, but I write about it and I've been interviewed about it and this was right after the movie The Exorcist came out and I was doing a lot of interviews about it. And That's unfair. What's unfair? To, to, to 
to kind of lead us that you might do it, but not let us know if you do it. <laughs> now we'll only awake all night. That's not ethical. <laughs> At least I'm not an elitist. Oh, okay. uh, I'll, you got a good memory. No, I have a very good memory, but I'll, you know, I'll exercise maybe anybody. I'm not an elitist when it comes to exorcism. <laughs> How did we get off on that? We're talking about providence. Providence, yes, but that doesn't have to do with exorcisms. Now, because of this view that God controls or may control disease and health as a punishment or a reward, the rabbis apparently felt the need, and because there were people who believed this, they apparently felt the need to try to justify the practice of medicine. And they tried to do it in a number of ways. And I'll give you, say, eight examples of how they tried to do this. In the Jewish legal codes, the dominant text quoted as a justification is a text in Exodus chapter 21, I think it is, where it says like this, if one person strikes another person and injures the other person, they have to pay for, say, pain and suffering. They have to pay for the damage to the limb that they hurt. They have to pay a few other th things and damages. And then it says, rapo yerape, which means he has to pay also for his medical costs of medical care as a result of the damages the other person inflicted. So in the Talmud, in the Trekti Baba Kama, the rabbis argue that implied in this verse is that it is permissible for the physician to cure. Because who is the guy who is injured going to go to, to affect the cure, to the physician? So it's a kind of implicit claim. The fact that they had to find an implicit claim in a text that really has to do with tort law, has nothing to do with medicine, this text. It has to do with laws of torts, of damages of assault shows that it's not explicit in the Bible. So they had to try to find it implicitly. A second approach which you find, and Maimonides himself, by the way, a great physician, argues this way, that in Deuteronomy there is a law that says if somebody loses something and you know it's theirs, you have to return it to them. And this is interpreted to mean that if a person gets sick, namely they lose their health, you have to return it to them. Therefore, medical care is permissible. So again, it's an implicit interpretation. Clearly, if you read a verse in the Bible, if A loses something and B finds it and B knows it belongs to A, they should return it. I doubt that any of you would ever think this is a justification for medical care. So the fact that they, have, they find it here, are, again, shows that it's implicit and not explicit. In the 13th century, you have Nachmanides, not Maimonides, but Nachmanides, who himself also, by the way, was a physician, tries to find a biblical verse to hang it on. And he finds it in a very generic way. In the biblical verse, you should love your neighbor as yourself. This again, it seems, shows that it's not explicitly there. A fourth view is to tie it into a religious requirement. 
There is a religious requirement called in Hebrew pikuach nefesh, which means saving a life. So they say, well, medical care is saving a life. Because if the person is left without it, they might die. Now here you see a kind of jump from the other texts. And it's this jump I'm going to talk about a little later, but let me now just simply lay out the problem. In the other texts, the idea is that the physician has the permission, has the option, has the possibility of medical care, giving medical care. It's not a requirement in that view. It's a permission. In Hebrew, the term is reshut. But once you tie it in with pikuach nefesh, saving the life, saving the life being a commandment, being a law, then it's no longer a permission, but is a requirement, is a commandment in Hebrew mitzvah. And this will become one of the issues that percolates through the literature, particularly in the Middle Ages and beyond. Namely, is the delivery of medical care and is the seeking by the physician and is the seeking of medical care by the patient a reshoot, something that's optional, permissible, possible, or is it mitzvah? Is it something that's required, halakha, something that's legally prescribed, prescribed? We'll get back to that later. Maimonides, let's forget it, wait. Forget about Maimonides here. All right, so I'll give you seven reasons. This was four. This was four, now let me give you five. Five, you find in a group of uh, late Midrashim that medical, the medical art was transmitted to human beings by an angel. In other words, it's an esoteric knowledge that the angel transmitted to human beings. In some versions of the legend <coughs> to Adam, in some versions of the legends to Noah, in some versions of the le legends to others. And generally the angel is, by no surprise, Raphael, the healing angel. All angels, as I mentioned, to a specialist, and Raphael is the AMA angel, healing angel. <laughs> so, in this view, medicine is a gnosis. It's a hidden knowledge. It's an esoteric knowledge that is transmitted to us. It's an angelic knowledge which is transmitted to us for us to use for human benefit. The sixth view is to try to find precedents in the Bible where people tried to cure other people who were afflicted. In other words, where people who have some authority act as role models on the basis of what they did. So for example, who is the most important person in the Bible? I mean, the greatest Jew of all? Moses. Moses. So if Moses practiced medicine, that shows that it's not against God's will. So some bring the, this precedent. When Moses, the story in the Bible, when Moses married the Ethiopian woman, his sister Miriam, spoke out against it. And according to biblical story, was stricken with leprosy as a result, as a punishment for slander. And then it says, Moses then cured her. Miriam, his sister. So if Moses cured her, it shows that even in a case where God it's clear that God is punishing a person for the sin. The human being has the right, has the option, has the obligation to intercede in order to bring about the cure. 
Well, if there was, Moses apparently had it. Was, was that put out as him directly doing it or by um, asking God to remove it? Well, by asking God to do it, but the assumption is he really did it. In other words, that he manipulated God. Okay, but it's sort of like this indirect thing rather than a direct. It's a, it depends how you read the text. If you read the text that it was a prayer, prayer of entreaty, it's an indirect. If you read it that, like the Hasidim would read it, that it's a prayer where Moses gave the orders and God marched along, then it's a difference. As a matter of fact, you have that, that story with the golden calf, where God says to Moses, I'm going to destroy the whole people, right? Mm -hmm. And Moses says to God, no, you're not. Mm -hmm. And God says, what do you mean, no, I'm not? I'm God. I can do whatever the hell I want. <laughs> and Moses says, no, you can't. And God says, why can't I? And Moses says, two reasons. And God says, what's the first reason? Strange question for somebody who's omniscient to ask. <laughs> and, God sa and, and Moses says, first reason is bad press. Uh -huh. And Moses says, and God says, what do you mean bad press? And Moses says, well, how will it look for you? You took these people out of Egypt and you go kill them all in the desert? What do people say? This God of the Jews is nuts? Takes them out of Egypt with all these miracles and then kills them? And God says to Moses, okay, so what's this? I don't care about my self-image. What's the second uh, reason? And Moses says, you promised. So what do you mean I promised? I promised the patriarchs to deliver them. It wasn't conditional. Didn't say, I'll deliver them if they make a golden calf. Don't make a golden calf. I'll deliver them. And go to the promised land and all this. And make them a great nation. All this. It wasn't conditional. Promise the patriarch. So God changes his mind. And the Hebrew there is very interesting. Because it can be translated and was understood by the rabbi should be translated as God says to Moses, I repent according to your word. Word? Word. In other words, Word. I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Idea of God makes a mistake. It's a theology class, I deal with this, I don't want to get into it here. But in the Talmud, in I think it's Tractate Moed Katan, page 16, it discusses this story, and then there's a phrase that describes what happened there. And the phrase in Hebrew is, Tzadik Ozer, Vahakadosh Baruch Hu Mekayim. The righteous, in this case Moses, makes a decree, and God follows the decree. HaKadosh Baruch Hu Gozer Gezera God makes a decree V'hat Tzadik Muvat La And the, the Tzadik, the righteous one, cancels it out. In other words, certain people <coughs> sort of give God his marching orders. And this idea becomes very prevalent in Hasidism. Because they interpret the word tzaddik to refer not to Moses, but to the Hasidic master. So here, if you read this text with Moses and uh, this business with uh, uh, Miriam's leprosy, to be a prayer of entreaty, yes, it's indirect. But if you read it this way, it's, it's very direct. Yes, sir. Would the same um, hold true for the story of, uh, of Abraham and Bill? Uh, exactly, sure. Yes. Uh, the only difference was God destroyed the cities anyway. Why wouldn't Moses cure uh, people with leprosy besides his sister? He wouldn't have been a greater uh, incident. Look, I wasn't there. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Why Moses did what he did, I don't know. If I was him, I would have stayed as prince of Egypt, had a comfortable life, you know. I don't know. I mean, wouldn't you have rather stayed there with Anne Bancroft than go out in the desert with all these complaining Jews? Anne Baxter. It was not, it was Elizabeth Taylor. No, it was Anne Baxter. Right? Anne Baxter? Yeah. It was Anne Baxter? Yes. Now, how is she related to, uh, what's her name? Ann Baxter. And uh, how is Ann Baxter related, what's her name? Kathleen Turner. I think it's her, her uh, isn't it her aunt or something like this? <laughs> I, I don't expect you to know what happened 2,000 years ago, but I'm talking about now. 
All right, here's the seventh uh, example. I'll stop with seven. And this is uh, a midrash in uh, the midrash on Proverbs. And there they tell a little story. And the story is that uh, Rabbi Akiva was walking uh, down the road and uh, he met a farmer. Uh, and the farmer says to him, uh, I heard you help cure people. Is it uh, permissible uh, to cure people? And Akiva said, uh, yes, it's permissible for a physician to cure people. The farmer said, how is it possible when if a person becomes ill, it's God's will, how can one interfere? So Akiva said to the farmer, um, what time of the year is it now in the agricultural year? And the farmer said, it's the planting season. Akiva said, well, what do you do? I don't know anything about farms. What, what goes on there? And the farmer says, well, we, we prepare the ground, we water it, we fertilize it, we sow the seeds, we tend the seeds, we take care of the young plants, we, we prune them, we cover them when it gets cold, we, we make sure they don't get too hot. We uh, water them, we this, that, and we cultivate the plants, and then we take the plants uh, and we harvest them, and uh, eventually we uh, save from the wheat, make bread, and stuff like this. So Akiva says to him, why do you do all that? Why don't you just leave it all to God? Why do you, how can you say that medicine is against God's will and farming isn't? <laughs> One is a cultivation of the health and the other is a cultivation of the soil and the plants. So this is the eighth argument. In other words, the argument is that the human being and God are not antagonists but rather partners. And each has their role in the process of, uh, say, cure, just as each has its role in, say, the process of uh, cultivation of a field. Now let me turn to a, a rather enigmatic text. Seven. I decided seven was enough. I mean, I could give you ten, but I'd rather distill them. Now let me move to a, a rather bizarre text that's found in the uh, Talmud. Uh, actually, in the Mishnah, the early stratum of the Talmud. If you want to look it up, it's in the Tractate Kiddushin. 82a. Or if you want to look at the mission, it's in chapter 4. And here is the text. You're going to find this text very bizarre. It discusses various occupations. And it says like this, Most donkey drivers are wicked. But most camel drivers are proper. The Hebrew term for proper there is kshirim, like kosher. Now comes really bizarre statement. Most sailors are saintly. Mm, that is bizarre. <laughs> Hebrew term there uses chassidim. And now comes the uh, phrase we're interested in. And the best of doctors go to hell. Wow. In Hebrew it's tov shebarofim ligihino. The best doctors go to hell. <coughs> That's the phrase. Tov sher barofim ligihino. The best doctors go to hell. So, immediately, the commentators are asking, what does this mean? The best doctors go to hell. Now, it's clear from this, if not from anything else, 
that there still remained an ambivalency in the sources regarding the propriety of medical care. For sure, there was a hesitancy of giving a kind of blank check, carte blanche, to physicians to practice whatever they wanted in any way they wanted. Because remember, as I mentioned to you, one tradition is that medical care is reshoot. It's permission. It's not a blank check. Permission means there are controls. Now, as we look in the commentary, and, um, and you do, therefore, also find, uh, let me say, both cynical and satirical views of medical care in Jewish uh, literature. Let me give you an example of a cynical view, and then I'll give you an example of a sat satirical view. Example of the cynical view is the late Hasidic master, the 19th century master, Nachman of Bratislav, who died when he was in the 40s, surf uh, suffered from tuberculosis, went to many physicians, and obviously was never cured. He died when he was in the 40s. And he says like this. He says, when God created the angel of death, the angel of death came to God and protested. He said, you've given me too much work. It's too much work for one angel to go around all over the world and collect the souls of all the people who die every day. It's a lot of work for one angel. So Nachman says, so God said to the angel of death, don't worry, I have given you helpers called physicians. That's a cynical view. Now, one of the things that bothered Nachman of Bratislav was that, in his view, as he looked at medical care in the late in the 19th century, early 19th century, he saw physicians essentially using the biomedical model we talked about before. Because he says, contemporary physicians, talking about his own time, are practicing witchcraft, he says. Because witchcraft means attending only to the physical and not to the spiritual. Now, Nachman's view of disease, which may sound to you either very bizarre or very avant-garde, I don't know how you'll take it, was that a physical symptom of a disease, he said, is usually a physical symptom of a deep inner spiritual disturbance. And if you can find out what is the deep inner spiritual disturbance, that's the starting place for treating the physical manifestation. But if you treat only the physical symptom and don't address the issue of the spiritual disturbance, then you haven't cured anything then you've just temporarily taken away the symptom. But if the disturbance is so deep, it will return anyway. Now, I'm not saying I agree with him, because I wouldn't say you can show that every physical you know, problem is a result of a spiritual disturbance, but I would say there's something to this. So that's the, uh, the cynical view. Let me give you the, the satirical view. Satirical view, an example is you find in the works of a medieval Jewish writer uh, named Joseph Ibn Zabara in a book which happens to be translated into English called um, The Book of the Light. The, the, the Book of Delight. In, in Hebrew, it's Sefer Shashuim. And in there, he tells the following story. He says, once there was a philosopher 
And the philosopher called his physician, and the physician came, examined the philosopher, and told the philosopher he was so sick, there's no reason even to treat him. So the physician left. After he left, the philosopher recovered. And one day, the philosopher was walking along the street, and he met this physician. Said the physician to the philosopher, have you come back from the, other, the next world? Because he assumed he died. The philosopher, making a joke on him, said, yes, I have. And the physician says to the philosopher, what did you see there? And the philosopher says, there I saw the terrible punishments that fall upon physicians, for they kill their patient. And the physician then looked very alarmed when he heard that. So the philosopher turned to the physician, he says, but you shouldn't feel alarmed because I swore to them there in the next world that you're no physician. <laughs> now, in the commentaries on this verse, on this uh, statement in the Talmud, the best of physicians uh, go to hell, you have some ideas about the restrictions or the focus that should be put on medical care. The greatest of the Jewish commentators, as you probably know, was Rashi, who lived in 11th century France. And he said, what does this mean, the best of physicians go to hell? He says, this refers to the physician who believes that when the patient recovers, it's because of his skill and that God plays no role. In 17th century <coughs> Poland, Rabbi Samuel Edels, the Marsha, as he's called, has sort of one step further development of this argument. He says, what does it mean the best of physicians go to hell? He says it means the physicians who think they're the best of physicians are the ones who go to hell because they tend to be arrogant. And quoting Rashi, he says, one way they tend to be arrogant is that they tend to think that when the patient recovers, they did it all themselves. God had no role that they're more skilled than they really are, and that they know more than they really do. According to some of the commentators, they add another category, and that is the physician who thinks he's the best of all physicians and therefore never asks the advice of his colleagues, never consults with his colleagues when he doesn't know, because he thinks he knows. The Maharal of Prague, Rabbi Judah of Prague, says like this, the best of physicians goes to hell, refers to those who, do not, who deal only with the physical dimension of medical care and who deny the spiritual dimension of medical care. In other words, he says, Gehinom, hell, represents the physical dimension of life. And those who go to hell are the ones who are what we'd call today, say, naturalists, rather than believing in the spiritual dimension, the supernatural dimension, so forth. And one final example, a little later on, in, uh, not very much later than the Maharal, but in Poland, there was a rabbi, Moshe Matt, he lived in southeast Poland, and he wrote a book, and has in this book, uh, Matem Moshe, The Rod of Moses, it's called, a large discussion there of medical issues. And there he says, the physician who 
who thinks, who, I'll put it another way, the physician who is not aware of the fact that he or she is the agent of God and the partner of God goes to hell because they don't really understand their job description. So, what comes out of these commentaries to this rather strange rabbinic statement is number one, that the role of the physician is to be the agent of God, the partner of God, that the physician is given permission to cure, but not absolute permission. They can't do whatever they want. There are limitations on what they can do, and there are limitations put on particularly their ego. Because what all of these commentaries point to is that the physician who expresses too much pride, too much omniscience, too much omnipotence, will not be able to function as a physician, and therefore as the one that Mishnah talks about is going to hell. And next, the idea that the physician's essential role is as an educator, to educate the patient in the way to prevent illness and to attain uh, health. That the physician is a kind of guide. In the ethical will of Ibn Tibbon, who lived in around the time of Maimonides, who himself was a physician. He writes to his son who is a physician, and he says, don't expect the patient to listen to you unless you practice what you're telling him yourself. In other words, the physician as a kind of role model. So this is the idea of the role of the physician, the agent of God, the partner of God, with permission, but not complete permission. I'll come back to this in a minute. Ego management, role as educator, and role model. Now, when we look in the medieval codes of Jewish law, first, for example, in the Tur, which is the great 14th century code of Jewish law. They say the reshut, the permission, is given to the physician to cure, and then they immediately have to try to define what does that mean? What means reshut? What means permission? So, one view they express there, this is in, do you know what the Tur is, by the way? Have you heard of this before? The tour is an abbreviation for the name of the code, which is Arba'a Turim, means the four columns. It refers to the biblical description of the four columns of jewels on the breastplate of the high priest. And the author or editor of the Arba'a Turim was Jacob Ben Asher, who was an Ash from Ashkenazic roots, but who lived in Spain. And what he did is, let me put it another way. He lived in the 14th century. In the 12th century, Maimonides wrote his great code of Jewish law called the Mishnah Torah. Maimonides' code covered everything, even things that weren't practiced in those days, like laws of sacrifices in the temple and things like this. The Arba Turim, or in short, the Tur, <coughs> dealt only with laws that are operative now. And what he did was to divide the Jewish laws that are operative now into four sections, just like there were four rows. That's why it's called four rows. In the breastplate of the high priest. So there are four sections. So you have, for example, uh, Choshen Mishpat that deals with... Um, uh, 
let's say, civil law. And then you have uh, Eurydia that deals with laws of forbidden and permitted things like, uh, say, dietary laws. Uh, or Achaim, which deals with daily stuff and so forth. And the Shulchan Aruch, the last authoritative code of Jewish law, done in the 16th century by Joseph Caro, follows exactly the structure of the tour. As a matter of fact, Joseph Caro wrote a very extensive commentary to the tour called the Beit Yosef, and the Shulchan Aruch, which is the last authoritative code of Jewish law written, written in the 16th century, is really a kind of reader's digest of the commentaries to the tour by Caro. So this is a very important code. And um, here in paragraph, if you want to look it up, 336, it's not translated. He discusses what does this mean that the reshut, the permission, is given to the physician to cure. And here are some of his ideas. He says, number one, permission is given to protect the exposure of the physician for medical malpractice if the physician has done their job. In other words, if the patient dies, you could say the physician intervened and otherwise the patient wouldn't have died and therefore the physician is guilty of murder. So what the tour says is no. If the patient was ill, the physician did up to standard work, didn't commit malpractice, you can sue the, the physician for malpractice and you can certainly sue them, say, for murder. So reshoot means the permission to cure with certain protections, both for the patient and for the physician. Secondly, he says, reshut means a permission to cure which is not considered in opposition to divine retribution or provenance. In other words, still addressing this problem we raised before, where you could say that if the person is sick, medical care is an intervention. And then he begins to raise the other issue I mentioned to you before, and that is whether or not the permission to cure is reshut, is simply a permission, or whether it's a mitzvah. Is it something we have permission to do, or is it something we are obliged to do? Is it a license, or is it a requirement? I'm not going to get into all the details there, but simply uh, to raise the issue. Yeah. Um. <coughs> Okay. The final point I want to make, and I'll flesh this out more next time, is this. And that has to do with the role of the patient. We've already discussed what the nature of health, uh, the role of the physician. What's left is the role of the patient and the relationship between the patient and the physician. Let me introduce it, and then I'll take your question, and then it's time to leave, but let me introduce it this way. In the New Testament, you have that famous phrase of Jesus, Physician, heal thyself. In terms of particularly the medieval Jewish writers on this whole problem of the role of the physician and the patient, they would probably say, instead of physician heal, heal thyself, patient heal thyself. In other words, that the patient has responsibility for their own health care. The, the patient has responsibility to preserve their health as best they can, and has the responsibility to seek medical care when they need it. <coughs> and exactly what that means, we'll discuss more next time.